thank you for coming. I really appreciate everybody coming to my talk. This is Going Serverless with GraphQL. Hopefully you're in the right place. I'm Steve Faulkner. I'm at South Pole Steve on the internet. Somebody, somebody's in front of the projector. Dude in the white, if you could just scooch over a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm at South Pole Steve on the internet, on Twitter, on GitHub, pretty much anywhere you see that, that's me. Uh, I did go to the South Pole once, uh, but you have to ask me about that later. Um, it's not a story for today. I work for Bustle, where I'm a director of engineering. I've been there for just over two years. Uh, and this talk is actually kind of a follow-up to the talk I gave last year, which is called uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Serverless. Um, you can go check it out on YouTube, it's there. I also spoke yesterday, and the talk title was called uh, uh, GraphQL in the Wild. So that's, this talk is a little bit more in-depth into serverless. The one yesterday was more in-depth into uh, GraphQL. This talk is kind of a, I don't know, big combination of everything, um, and I'll, I'll get more into more detail about that. But I got, um, if you don't know, when you give these talks, they give you feedback at the end, right? You usually get a survey at the end and people can submit feedback. I get all kinds of good and bad feedback, but I got this piece of feedback last year. Um, and so I, it's, could you, he have used more buzzwords? And I was like, hmm, maybe I can. So that's where the, t <laughs> the title of this talk came from, uh, Going Serverless with GraphQL. But really, I, I probably a better title for this, this talk is An Oral History of Bustle Architecture. So uh, the last uh, two years, we essentially redid Bustle's architecture from the ground up with both GraphQL and serverless. And so this talk is about how we did that, things that happened along the way. Uh, you know, maybe it'll just be instructive so you understand what it's like to do something like that. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with Bustle, Bustle is uh, one of the largest uh, women's media companies, millennial women. Uh, we have probably now north of 80 million unique monthly users, um, and we are 100% production in both serverless and GraphQL. Uh, maybe a little asterisk next to the serverless part, because uh, mostly there's still a few servers that might be sitting around. Uh, first, before I start and kind of get into the starting from the beginning, um, I'm going to talk about this word serverless. Inevitably, somebody comes up to me after every one of these talks and says, but there are still servers. And I'm like, yes, I know there are still servers, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not that dense, right? Um, I am not a big fan of the word serverless, but for better or worse, it's come to uh, represent a collection of technologies and practices that people have been embracing. So I use it, but at the same time, not the hugest fan of the word. I think it confuses people. Uh, if I have to distill it down into one really simple idea, it's that instead of having to worry about servers anymore as our method of deployment, we're working about, worrying about platforms, right? So we can embrace platforms uh, for all the different parts of our, our stack. The essential idea is platforms got good enough, right? Where we don't have to have that one part that is still you know, our own server running custom code, right? We can kind of take all these platforms and glue them all together. And I'll get a little bit into how we did that a little later. Like I said, this, is, this talk is more uh, an oral history of uh, Bustle architecture. So I'm going to just start at the beginning. August uh, 2013, this is when Bustle launches. So Bustle was originally written in uh, Rails, uh, deployed on Heroku, which kind of is pretty common of startups of that time. I was not involved at this point. I actually joined in August 2015. Uh, this is not a real TechCrunch article, so don't go looking for it. Um, but uh, at, at, when I joined, the, the stack was kind of this, right? So uh, Rails, Redis, Postgres, Elasticsearch, Sphinx, um, and we were all hosting pretty much everything on Amazon Web Services, deploying onto EC2 using OpsWorks. So this is the, the state of the world when I joined Bustle. We had a couple big issues at that time. Um, we were having issues with Rails and, and Postgres, not necessarily performance-wise, but just being able to support the kind of workloads we needed, uh, the kind of development we wanted to do, getting things out the door. It was all of one big monolith and just wasn't able to move quickly enough. Uh, the other one is EC2 autoscaling, which it mostly worked, except when it doesn't, and then you have a problem, right? And for a, a company that at this scale, uh, sorry, this point I think we were about 30, 40 million uniques a month, when it doesn't work, it goes really bad, right? Like that's a bad day and you get calls in the middle of the night and stuff like that. So. You know, we were having not, not a great time there. And this is also uh, right when AWS API Gateway came out. I think it came out uh, at the end of July of 2015. So if anybody wants to talk about why the word serverless exists, it's because of API Gateway. So it, get, it doesn't get uh, enough attention, but, but Lambda had already existed for maybe a year, two years. There was just no way to publicly expose it via HTTP or no good way. 
And with the introduction of API Gateway, suddenly you could use Lambda as a real backend for an HTTP service. So this, I think, in my mind, is really what took serverless to like, the next level, right? This is what made it actually usable for a bunch of things. So AWS Lambda was already a thing, and you could combine the two, right? Um, like I said, first time you could expose Lambda via HTTP. So this got us to thinking, well, maybe we should try it, see what happens. So this is literally, I, I think, part of my interview was, hey, we're checking out this Lambda thing. What do you think about that? I was like, I don't know. I'll check it out. So we started looking. And we deployed our first um, endpoint. We took a very simple API that is essentially a big metrics collector and uh, had already been written in Node. It was one of our first Node things. And we deployed it to Lambda, API Gateway, uh, and it was a simple REST API. Costing us at the time, it was in, uh, deployed on EC2 when we had first written it. Uh, it was costing us about $2,500 a month, and when we deployed it to Lambda and API Gateway, it started costing us $400 a month. So this was a big, uh, a big deal, right? We, everybody was kind of like, okay, this, this thing is, this might work. Um, performance was good, scalability was good. Uh, we were pretty happy overall. And also, this is literally when the word serverless first started being used. I think soon after this, uh, the framework that is now known as a serverless framework was called JAWS, and they renamed to this uh, very shortly after this. But that brings me to the first issue that we had. Um, so suddenly, we're like, well, what, what's the problems here? And the big problem was deployment, right? Getting these things deployed, we were very much on the cutting edge of combining these things together and getting these things actually deployed in uh, Matters that were repeatable were very difficult. It was ended up just being this like really bad combination of bash scripts, and so I started working on this thing called Shep. So if you're not familiar with Shep, it's a deployment framework for AWS and API Gateway uh, that is for Node.js. So Node.js specifically, there's a bunch of other frameworks out there now. Um, we open sourced it, I think, in October of 2015. Uh, but check it out if you want to deploy Node frameworks to uh, AWS Lambda and API Gateway. So at this point, we, I spent about uh, maybe three or four weeks writing the first version of Shep. Uh, we started using that for all of our deployments, and overall, like, we're pretty happy. Everything's going really well. We're happy with the state of things. November 2015, fast forward, um, episode two, this is called the serverless front end. So we launched, uh, or we're in the process of launching a new property at that time. So we have bustle.com, which was the only property that was under the kind of company umbrella. And they wanted to launch a new property targeted at millennial moms. So this is called Romper. It exists today. And we had just started doing all the dev work and trying to figure out how that, uh, that was going to go. And we, we were using Lambda and API Gateway. And we said, hey, yeah, this is pretty nice. It works really well. Maybe we should try actually serving up a HTTP website with that and see how that goes. So we started using uh, Preact and doing server-side rendering. And it worked. Um, it actually worked really well. Node.js, server, doing server-side rendering of Preact. Uh, hosted on Lambda and API Gateway, actually serving HTML. So this was a, a big win. We got Romper out the door, I think, a lot quicker than we would have otherwise. It was overall a pretty successful thing in the company. Except, of course, there's something that had to go wrong. Um, and the first thing that happened is the servers went down. Um, so you might be wondering, like, well, how did your serverless servers go down? Uh, so there, there were still servers. Um, we were using Redis as the back end for all of this at the time. I got a quick default or pop quiz for you. Does anybody know what the default number of max Redis connections are? If you know, you can just shout it out. No? 10,000. 10,000 is a lot of connections, right? I mean, that's out the, out the box. You think, well, that's going to be hard to hit. Well, when you have all these little Lambda functions that are all spinning up and then just throwing away their connections at the end and not telling uh, Redis that the connection is closed, you're going to hit that limit pretty quick. Um, so 10,000 connections. So this was the, the first thing we went to production. Um, all of our Redis boxes suddenly freaked out, and we couldn't connect to them even just to you know, figure out what was going on, and it was kind of a little bit of a disaster. But we sorted it out, and we figured out what was happening, and adjusted all of our settings so that we could uh, actually maintain our Redis connections. Uh, the lesson learned there is nothing is a silver bullet. So even the serverless stuff has issues. Uh, if anybody kind of tells you it's going to be perfect or going to be uh, magic auto scaling and it's going to you know, go to infinity, well, that's never true. So don't believe, don't believe anybody who tells you that. But we fixed it. We solved it. And like, we're sort of uh, overall we're happy again. Everything's going OK. Fast forward to spring 2016. Uh, and suddenly GraphQL enters the picture. So 
at Bustle, I, I wish I could uh, tell you the story about how we looked at all of these different technologies and we made very careful measured decisions about them, but that's really not how it went down. Um, Bustle engineers, we have a lot of flexibility on our team. Our culture is very much, hey, try some stuff, experiment, see how it goes. Uh, we give people a lot of freedom, which has been great, and we've got a lot of stuff out the door that's been really cool as a result. That's why I was able to make Shep. Um, one of our other engineers started looking at GraphQL and said, hey, this is really cool. And suddenly we have GraphQL in production. Um, and at the time, I was actually not a fan of GraphQL. I was looking at it and I was saying, ah, REST is, REST is fine. I know how REST works. I don't need to deal with any of this complicated stuff. Like, you know, leave me alone. So I, I was actively kind of pushing against GraphQL, but it turns out GraphQL is so awesome, and I'm a convert now. I've since seen the error of my ways. Um, that our, our front end engineers just started using these APIs this person was producing because it was so much easier to develop with. It was great. So GraphQL appears, um, and uh, oh, by the way, it was written in PureScript as well, which was a little bit of an, another thing. So at this stage, here is our, uh, here's our stack. Rails, Redis, Postgres, Elasticsearch, Sphinx. We still have all that old stuff. We're still maintaining it and having to run it. The bulk of our workload is still running through those things. And we've got all this new stuff going through Node, Lambda, API Gateway, GraphQL, and PureScript. Uh, about this time, we're also having another realization uh, about the word serverless. So I, I said, you know, servers, serverless, I, I showed that slide with servers and talking about, really, it's about platforms. But we actually kind of had this other realization. It's, it's not, it's sort of about platforms, that's part of it, but it's also about events. Um, we started seeing all these other things that were on AWS that we weren't really using and realizing Lambda can talk can be the glue between these things. So you can imagine all of these like little green things are essentially Lambda functions. And I think AWS particularly has done a really good job of this. They've essentially made functions as a service into cloud glue, right? And that's now you know, how I see Lambda in our stack, right? It's not so much like this backbone of our compute infrastructure. It's more how we link all of these different AWS things together. So um, I think this is maybe a better thing than serverless. If you want to popularize cloud glue, I'd be happy to run with that. Um, so this kind of got us thinking, okay, like maybe we should take this to the next level. Maybe we should kind of go all in. So summer 2016, uh, episode three, all in. We decided to essentially migrate all of Bustle's infrastructure over to Lambda, API Gateway, GraphQL, serverless, the whole thing. Um, so before we even like launch any of that, uh, what goes wrong? The serverless servers are down. So. If you're not familiar with uh, Lambda, and, and you'll have to go check out some stuff online or one of my other talks to get more in depth on Lambda, but there is an account level concurrency limit. So this is still true today. I'm really hoping they fix this at some point. But essentially, you can only run a certain number of functions at a time. I believe the, the number is really high now. It's maybe like two or 3,000. But at the time, it was maybe 100, right? They had had these pretty strict limits on Lambda. So imagine that you're running a production level workload test on a set of test infrastructure, right? Like, well, what happens then? Well, you hit your account level concurrency limit, and that means all of your production stuff that was running at lower levels goes down, right? Because they can't spin up new lambdas anymore. So this is what happened to us. Uh, we did this, and we were like, why is the ROPR down, right? Nothing's, and we're not, we're not working on ROPR stuff right now, and well, it turns out this is why. So uh, lesson learned. This is uh, still a problem with Lambda. It's still something you're going to have to deal with. Uh, reinvents in a few months, so I don't know. Hopefully by the time this talk comes out on YouTube that it'll be fixed. But I've been waiting for it for a while. So November 2016, um, and we, we finally launch our entirely serverless stuff. Uh, to give you a little bit of um, maybe foreshadowing, the episode is called The Gang Writes Their Own Graph Database. Um, so at this point, we're 100% Lambda, 100% GraphQL. Um, everything's going pretty well. Uh, we're overall very happy. It's, it's an improvement over what we had before. So now we have one other issue that we're kind of still dealing with. Um, this is a quote from the Facebook data loader, uh, data loader uh, readme that kind of explains why they built GraphQL, or at least part of the reasons for it. And it says, to coalesce the sundry key value backend APIs uh, which existed at the, at the time. And this is a problem that we had at Bustle. So I, I kind of showed you that stack and all the different databases we had, right? Well, we have all these databases storing all kinds of data, and it's an issue, right? We have too many databases. We're not really able to 
support the, the kind of queries we want to do. We're starting to, and we're getting bigger. We're starting to support more salespeople, more advertising people. They want to know new information that we're not able to provide. So uh, it gets a little problematic. So at this point, uh, we, we've, we're really big fans of Redis. Of all the things we've been using as, as backend data stores at this point, Redis is really the one that has you know, been the biggest win for us. And so we said, well, what can we do to fix this, right? What can we do to get this all in one place? So I started saying, well, let's try to write a, a thing that basically combines Redis and GraphQL together. Uh, internally, we, we haven't open sourced this yet, but I'm, I'm hoping we will at some point. Um, it's kind of all a little muxting with all of our other stuff at the moment, but it's an internally called Gradius, which is some sort of combination of Gradius, GraphQL and Redis. Um, and how it really works is it's uh, essentially our own graph database that sort of understands GraphQL. It's based on Hexastores, which there's some good information on that online if you want to read about it. Um, Redis sorted sets uh, GraphQL. It actually understands kind of the GraphQL types and how to serialize and deserialize those from Redis. And then Data Loader, which is kind of the, the backbone of the whole thing, makes querying everything really efficient because it's able to batch calls. So this is kind of our our special in-house uh, graph database that we use. We actually did evaluate a lot of the publicly available graph databases. Uh, we spent a lot of time kind of benchmarking them and seeing what they would work. And short story, we kind of were not happy with any of them. The only thing out there that m we really thought could do production stuff was um, uh, Neo4j. We're really excited about introducing the JVM with all this other stuff we had going on. And so really none of the other ones that are out there. There's uh, Google has one called Kaylee that I think has potential. Um, there's another one called dgraph, which is based on uh, some internal Google stuff that Google employees left and started making. Uh, that is not production ready, but I have hope that it will be one day. It actually, I think, natively speaks GraphQL as well, so super interested to see where that comes, or that ends up. Okay, so I covered like a bunch of stuff so far, so I'm uh, gonna just like do a, a quick recap and then kind of talk about the, the next, the last year and the stuff we've been working on. So we had this old REST API, it was built on Rails, then we had this new REST API and it was on Lambda, then we had this new GraphQL API and that was on Lambda, and now we're in the summer in 2017. So I'll show that for a little longer, just so you can see. Like this is, this is kind of the, the state of things. Summer 2017, so this is earlier this year. Um, Episode five, how do you buy a company? So we got this uh, call from somebody and one of our higher ups in the organization and said, hey, we're thinking about buying this company. And then the next Monday we had bought a company. Um, so uh, Bustle bought Elite Daily, which was really cool. And uh, we were super excited about it, but they're like, well, you have to get all of their stuff you know, integrated with our stuff. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we were gonna do that and what the best way to work, do it was. They were all on WordPress and we had kind of all our own custom internal stuff. So um, this is kind of now the, the state of things and we're trying to figure out what to do. So I'm gonna emoji react all of these. So we have the, the unspeakable stuff that we don't really wanna deal with anymore. We have the stuff that we kind of liked but now we're not so big of a fan of. We have the first iteration of the stuff we built in GraphQL, but uh, it's a bunch of it's still in pure script. So it's kind of a little bit, uh, you know, like I said, upside down. We like it, but there's things that we need to change about it. And then we have this new third party stuff that we can't get rid of because that's what makes us money. So this is where Gradius comes in. Uh, and Gradius is this, you know, GraphQL layer that we essentially decided to deploy across the whole thing, uh, talking to, you know, all of the legacy stuff as well as kind of ingesting data. And so everybody's happy. So this is um, kind of the state of things today. I'm going to talk about the kind of approaches that we took in order to like layer this GraphQL on top of everything else. And really there's just three things. The probably obvious first one is that you just build new APIs. This is pretty straightforward. Um, new stuff, immediately we said, okay, everything goes through Gradius and nothing is going to go through any of these old APIs. So uh, that was step one. Step two, wrap legacy APIs. A lot of that old Rails stuff, um, we've managed to turn most of it off, but there's still a few things that we just call through to, and that's the easiest way we figured out how to do it. Uh, don't spend a lot of time with it. Uh, some different strategies uh, that we kind of have used to do that, right, um, and turn stuff off. Um, I'm definitely missing a slide here. All right, so um, the third one is uh, importing data, right? So we actually uh, started, instead of having to figure out how we we're gonna call through to WordPress and still maintain running WordPress servers and do all that stuff, we decided to say, well, let's import their data into our system. 
So these are the strategies we took there. Um, first, we just started reading through. Uh, we started doing some copy on read and write. Finally, uh, we started doing dual writes, and we do this with some of our own legacy stuff where we'll write to two different databases at once just to maintain the two systems, and then uh, lastly, replace. Eventually, you can just turn it off. But there's always this problem, and that's, you know, you have crufty data, right? So you have data in these systems that is not, uh, especially with GraphQL and its typed nature, right? It expects certain kind of data out of your system, and your legacy system might not quite be up to that standard. So we started doing something with GraphQL that I think has worked out really well, uh, and that's we actually import data with mutations. So again, I'm gonna start talking about GraphQL here. If you need more in-depth GraphQL knowledge, gonna have to go elsewhere, but um, essentially this is what uh, we do. This is a GraphQL schema, uh, or a GraphQL, simple GraphQL schema, and we started importing data into our system using GraphQL. And this worked really well because GraphQL is typed, and so it allowed us to verify data coming in, making sure it was actually of the correct format. Um, you can see, like, you know, there's an integer required author ID, and we could go back to the team we were interfacing with and the company we bought and say, hey, here's a list of things that are, you know, list of IDs that are wrong, right, or a list of IDs that our system can't process. And uh, it worked out super well. So uh, runtime types have totally destroyed our crafty legacy data problem. And this actually went all live on Monday. So this is our, um, our live, I think this is like per second Lambda invocations look. Um, and you can see what happened, which was essentially we switched all of their DNS over to our DNS uh, on Monday morning and we essentially doubled our Lambda invocations um, in one day. So uh, super happy. I'm, uh, I told the team, I was like, yeah, so I'm gonna go give a talk about how we did this on, on Wednesday or Thursday and uh, you need to have it all done. And they did it, they did an amazing job. So, um, so we did it, we're, we're here, uh, we're all GraphQL, all Lambda, everything's in production and everybody's happy. So now we just gotta figure out uh, what next crazy thing we're gonna do. Uh, that's it, that's the whole thing. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of that. In front. How do you go about, do you go about uh, monitoring diagnostics in serverless? All right, so you asked about monitoring in serverless. Uh, it's definitely gotten better. So X-Ray has come out from AWS, came out in like re-event last year, and that we use a lot for kind of monitoring uh, some of our Lambda and some of the you know cloud glue stuff, right? How all the different services talk to each other. Uh, CloudWatch works pretty well. It's, it's not the best, but it's not the worst. It's another product they've improved a lot since the beginning. There's also some extra, um, some startups that are doing this, kind of doing monitoring for serverless. The best one I know of is called IOPipe. Um, we've used them for some stuff and are, are pretty big fans. So it's, it's still an issue though. It's gotten better. Like when we were doing this in 2015, it was terrible. And we would have stuff go down, we had no idea why, and we couldn't get at logs, and it was not, not fun. Um, AWS has improved as well as kind of the state of tooling has improved. But at the end of the day, like there's about you know, two decades worth of tooling that we just threw out the window, right? You can't SSH into the box and use whatever you were used to using. So um, it's, it's got a ways to catch up. Yeah. Okay, so he asked about Redis connections, how we solved that issue. Um, so out of the box, Redis will, basically keep connections alive forever from the Redis side if, if the server side doesn't close it um, or if the client side doesn't close it and then it has the default limit of 10,000. Redis can send TCP keep alive packets back to the client and if those don't, a certain number of those don't get replied to then it'll just uh, drop the connection itself. So that's pretty much the primary way we do it. Ideally Lambda will come up, uh, at, come out with some point with like a, a way to run a little script at the end before it shuts down the container. This is one of the issues with Lambda, right? They'll, when you're done running the function, it just kind of throws everything away and there's no cleanup part of that. So hopefully Lambda will improve that, but we were able to tweak all the settings on the Redis side, so essentially it drops connections much faster than it would otherwise. Other questions? In the back. Yeah, so she asked about container warming times. So cold function starts versus warm function starts with Lambda is a huge issue and um, you could you know, probably do a whole talk just on that kind of stuff. The good news is, is that 
Node has pretty good performance there. Um, we've overall haven't seen too many issues with crazy cold start times. We do share uh, like a Redis connection between uh, Lambda functions, right? If it's uh, running in the same container, uh, and, and AWS lets you do that. But generally, it can still be an issue, if, especially if you do a lot of stuff in your uh, kind of startup script for your Lambda function. If you're like talking to S3 and downloading a file at the beginning of your, every Lambda function, that's going to be a bad time for you. Uh, if the JVM people I know are sometimes not the happiest with Lambda because they have you know, these startup times and kind of performance issues right out of the gate before all the JVM stuff is warm. So it's definitely an issue, but less of an issue than I think we thought it would be. Um, there are people that also do stuff like ping Lambda every, whatever, four or five seconds in order to keep at least one container alive so that they're never having cold start issues. That's another thing I hope AWS just fixes. You know, pay, pay me an extra 50 bucks a month and we'll keep one container alive and then you never have a cold start problem. Would be cool. Over here. Uh, so that's kind of what I was talking about with Redis. That's another thing I should probably just do a whole other talk on. Um, we, we made our own graph database with Redis. So it, there's a, they'll show you how to do this. It's in the Redis documentation. Um, if you go look at, sec, this called secondary indexing in Redis. It's like the website. It's part of the normal Redis docs. They link out to a paper on hexastores, and you can kind of see how setting up hexastores with sorted sets gives you essentially a graph database in Redis. So the, the Nature of Redis sorted sets is they're lexicographically sorted, which means you can construct these big strings that represent all the relationships in the graph, all the edges, um, and you can kind of query that using uh, lexicographical sorting. So it works actually really well, and it's super, super performant. So that, that's one of the biggest issues for us is we have a, a, a very, very heavy read load, right? And so we have issues with that on some of our other previous stuff, and so Redis has been really great there. It's super fast. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thank you very much.